Hey, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Belvi Asset Management, I would like to welcome you to our update call on BB Biotech today, September 15th, 2020. My name is Patrick Fishley. I'm your host for this call. In our March call, we've presented you the initial findings on COVID-19. In our June call, we were able to highlight the uh, first company with possible solutions on COVID-19. Today, on one hand, we would like to bring you up to date with the latest findings on COVID vaccination. And, and this is a very important part, we would like also to look at other diseases area. Field of investments which are currently somewhat in the background, but which promise high growth potential. In Q1 and Q2, some interesting companies have been added to the portfolio of BB Biotech. Fate Therapeutics and Black Diamond Therapeutics are researching in the field of cancer, while Generation Bio enables gene therapies for rare diseases. Dr. Dan Akola now shows us how these innovation approaches can lead to a versatile treatment options and what kind of growth we expect in those. Daniel, I might hand it over to you. The floor. Thank you and a welcome from my side. It's a pleasure to give you a quick update uh, regarding BB Biotech and I said uh, what's going on in the markets as of today. Um, we have this or close to standard presentation, which I'm going to go rather quickly and want to highlight, I said, a couple of key points and take home messages uh, where we think uh, we are set um, in mid of September. Let me start, though, with a quick intro regarding the company that they find on page five. I'm not going to go over this. Um, you see on the left hand side uh, some of the historic facts as well as key indices which uh, BB Biotech is part of on the right hand side um, some figures regarding liquidity all the way to uh, our dividend policy that uh, the board of director has announced uh, to continue even in the face of COVID-19. Just speaking of the board of directors you see the five representatives or members that we have from the board of directors on page six. Two new additions in 2020 let me focus on them. Um, Professor Mats uh, Krosgaard, uh, who is the CSO from Novo Nordisk. And we are very happy and thrilled as well that uh, Susan Galbright will join formally uh, in October 2020. Uh, she runs or leads actually the efforts and uh, research efforts in oncology for AstraZeneca. The team that is working closely together with the board of directors is what you find on page seven. Here, the update is, or actually no update on the front that you see here, that the people work together for many, many years, which I think is, is a strong positive. The news we have for you as of today is that we're going to strengthen by the team by one more member uh, to support and broaden us in the due diligence efforts that we think are going to play a major role uh, in the coming years. Um, quickly regarding performance and what has happened in the markets, you see on page eight, um, we're almost through with the third quarter. A clear distinction between these three quarters. Uh, Q1 was obviously uh, impacted by this pandemic or the COVID-19 driven sell-off that we have seen, as well as then the second quarter with uh, the strong rebounds that was driven by um, a lot of sector fund flows or inflows, better said, um, as well as expectation around um, the industry playing a major role in leading the race uh, for the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, as well as for different therapeutic modalities uh, to treat patients that are infected. And I said the third quarter then was a bit more of a consolidation. And just in recent days, again, uh, quite a bit of a rebound uh, driven as well by an acceleration in M&A, which I will touch later on as well. On slide nine, just a quick recap. 2019, for example, has been as well a positive year with north of 20% um, absolute performance um, for the sector and our portfolio and you see then in the longer term 10 years as well as since inception that we have achieved um, quite substantial compounded annual outperformance which is accumulated on the long-term chart or since inception on page 10 uh, but let's focus quickly on the middle bracket there where we have disclosed uh, the return or the compounded return figures. Uh, we are slightly shy of the 15% um, return on investment goal that we have for the net asset value. Uh, but I will outline now in, in the coming minutes as well, how do we think um, our portfolio, the industry, 
will continue uh, to evolve and why are we optimistic actually to achieve this as well uh, for the future. Before going to detailed portfolio and an update of what we have done and what's going on in our portfolio, just one slide of a portfolio overview uh, for industry overview, sorry for that. On page 12, you see on the bullet number one, the RD productivity and the easiest measure there is the product approvals. Uh, that's the history of the FDA product approvals we had over um, the last 15 plus minus years. 2018 was a record year with 59 approval. 2019, uh, you saw 48 of them. And year to date, so until mid-September, we are already at 40 new products approved. So the FDA or the regulators actually still act very efficiently. Although as well, they had to reshift a lot of resources, uh, obviously to the COVID-19 pandemic situation as such. And these product approvals are important because uh, they actually uh, support and sustain what you see on the bullet number two, a sustained high sales growth rate for the industry, uh, being in the high single digit to low teens that we see for the foreseeable future. And the last bullet, M&A as well, I said a lot of these products and technologies and innovation happen at the smaller mid-cap spectrum. That's as well uh, our positioning in the portfolio. Many of these companies will be acquired over the years. You see here an M&A history as such. Uh, 2020 has been so far an outlier year with the first half being very quiet, obviously impacted by COVID-19 as well. And as announced, we've seen a reacceleration of M&A the last couple of weeks, which we think uh, will continue as well, given as said uh, that the standard situation that the big pharma, big biotech companies require external innovation will continue as is and has been in the past. Quickly to the investment process, which is not new to uh, investors that track and follow BB Biotech but just allow me uh, to focus on the middle column there. So we have a broad universe of more than a thousand companies, um, actually a lot of IPOs and late stage private companies that are around. And still our job is uh, with a detailed due diligence effort to break this down or actually concentrate this into a portfolio of maximum 35 companies. And although we are in the COVID-19 pandemic situation, uh, BB Biotech early on decided not to switch uh, in terms of medical or disease areas that we focus on or on the technologies we focus on, but actually continue as is. We have one exposure, core exposure with Moderna into the topic, which I will quickly talk about in a minute or two. But on the left-hand side, you see here oncology, orphan diseases, central nervous system disorder, cardiovascular metabolic syndrome are still the key areas, both of due diligence efforts, as well as of our investment scope. And you see examples described from our current portfolio on the right hand side. And the same is true for what you see on page 16. Um, I said the spectrum of technologies and, and platforms actually to allow to tackle diseases has broadened quite substantially. Um, there as well, a careful evolution. Um, first, uh, obviously, is the new chemical entities as where the comp or actually the industry has started off. Then the, biolog the bio biologics and the RNA-based therapies that we have added a couple of years ago, five to 10 years actually, where we have done uh, more extensive investments into this area. And the last two, three years were actually uh, driven by more allocation towards cell-based therapies and the genetic medicines like gene therapy and gene editing. And one example of the good old small molecules, as we call them, is Vertex. Uh, Vertex is well our only last remaining large cap company that we have in the portfolio, and we just, or I can outline just why. On the right-hand side on slide 17, you see that the company has now actually four um, approved products in the market. The last one, the triple combo, Trikafta, actually being the most important one. Why is this so? You see this on page 18 on the left-hand side, actually the chart of the phase three trial for Trikafta, which in gray indicates patients treated with placebo versus green people treated with this triple combo. And you see there a very sharp and quick uh, spike in lung function to the positive, meaning a significant and substantial improvement in lung function. Uh, patients have to take this medication chronically. And I said the company could even though there was a pandemic and the shutdown actually due to the strength of the clinical data and this medication proved that the growth uh, continues absolutely unabated 
that the company is now on, on close to a run rate of 6 billion of revenues um, and has upgraded its guidance on the last second quarter earnings call. And that's the reason why we continue to hold on to Vertex because the company has for the foreseeable future a very strong top line and bottom line growth ahead of itself. The second company I want to quickly talk a bit more in detail is Moderna uh, for the obvious fact that Moderna is in the race or in the, is in the lead for the race uh, to not only develop but potentially get um, a COVID-19 vaccine approved as well late this year. Uh, the main reason for us, as simple as it is, is what you see on page 20. At the bottom there is still the biological core uh, function that DNA is our storage function that has to be translated into proteins so that the cell can function and that we require software to translate the storage into actually application function that's the so-called messenger RNA and that's the backbone modality that Moderna has worked many many years on and that now could exemplarily be proven how versatile and agile and and, and quick actually can develop therapeutic modalities if you apply the messenger RNA framework. And that's what we have described for you on page 21. You see the company lock down the sequence uh, for the therapeutic vaccine mid-January of this year. Uh, pretty much two months later, they started the first clinical trials in healthy volunteers. And in summer of 2020, they already initiated a large randomized phase three trial with 30,000 uh, participants to be enrolled. We are now close to 24,000 um, as of the last data point. You see here, uh, 10 days ago, there were 21,000. So indicating to you that within the next two, three years, the trial will be fully enrolled. And we expect actually uh, the primary endpoint to be read out in the October, November timeframe. Uh, the primary endpoint of this clinical trial is quite simple. It's if the vaccine or by how much the vaccine actually can reduce uh, symptomatic infection. If that's going to be positive, we assume that Moderna will be in uh, the position to have a first approved product by November, December timeframe and roll this out first in the US, followed then by Europe and other geographies to come. The main reason for us was not the COVID-19 vaccine as an investment case, but what you see on page 23 in the small boards described below, because the company focused already early on on other prophylactic vaccines. Um, important ones are CMV, um, RSV or Zika that you see described here with uh, a very important data point upcoming in the next couple of weeks, actually for the CMV vaccine, which could represent a multi-billion recurring uh, business opportunity for Moderna in the years to come. To close it out, as, as a quick update, the investment strategy, um, as said, over the last year has shifted towards broadening into different therapeutic modalities that allow to tackle severe but in the future as well common disorders. I uh, see here on the right hand side three new companies that we added in the first half of 2020, Generation Bio, Fate and Black Diamond, which I want to quickly introduce to you. Let me start with uh, Fate Therapeutics, which is actually a cell or a company focusing on cell-based therapies. We think it's the leading company in the so-called third generation cellular therapies um, that have the main application in oncology for now. What's so interesting for us uh, for FATE is actually the fact that FATE is in the lead to have a real industrial scale manufacturing process to develop these CAR T cells and NK cells that tackle cancer. So we think they can actually go for broader applications at lower costs. And we think that's gonna be a major differentiator for uh, the years to come. The second company works on small molecules, uh, if you want to say so, a bit more older fashion in that concept. But what's unique and highly intriguing for us is uh, the way they tackle novel or the, how they can target actually mutated proteins that have important function, how the cancer uh, propels growth and where the cancer is dependent on. So what the company is developing is, said, a small molecule uh, agents that actually can block mutated uh, proteins that other drugs in the market cannot tackle anymore. You're going to see in 2021 important uh, clinical data points. And we think I said Black Diamond there is as well a very attractive investment case, as is Generation Bio, an earlier stage company that will start clinical trials in the years to come. Why are we intrigued about it? Because it's the first time or actually the leading company that has developed genetic medicine or gene therapy approaches 
without the use of viral backbones, meaning a lot of pluses that we think will make a big difference in the future, such as the retreatment potential, larger insert side, and as I said, potential substantial benefits in terms of avoidance of certain uh, safety risks that we have seen over the last couple of quarters to come up uh, with the viral-based um, genetic uh, delivery systems that we have seen. That chart that you see on page 29, the investment strategy with the S-curve is not new. Um, we have informed uh, our shareholders over the last 18 months that said we have rebalanced the portfolio from more to top right. So have divested large cap biotech companies and have reinvested more at the bottom left part where the S-curve starts to cut uh, the red circle. And the goal obviously is still the ROI of 15%. And we're only going to achieve this if we continue to invest into the next generation innovation. The portfolio that will drive future performance is what you see on page 30. Let me start at the bottom part where you see the three new investments in the first half. Um, Fate, or um, then we have their Black Diamond and Generation Bio, each of them between one and 2% of actually allocation that we do as well from a risk avoidance stance because said young companies come with higher risk. So new investments are often smaller allocation and the top 10 holdings that drive the short and midterm performance mostly. These are actually companies we've invest, invested two, three, four years ago or many years ago and that have evolved through this S curve by obviously an increase in valuation and by that generating a performance for our portfolio and our shareholders. The breakdown on the portfolio you see on page 31. On the left-hand side, the different disease modalities. Three quarter of our portfolio is made up of companies focusing on orphan disease, oncology, and neuro. In the middle, you see our dollar exposure on the right-hand side. As I outlined, uh, we have only one investment left, that's Vertex in the large cap space, the dark gray piece of this uh, Kringle chart. Around half of the portfolio is focused on uh, the mid cap space that will obviously impact uh, the mid and short term performance going forward. And then around 40% is allocated towards the smaller cap, so below 5 billion market cap companies that will fit that where a the new allocation happens, meaning new investments, as well as where we have expectation that these companies will propel uh, the performance in, you know, the rather mid to longer term as such, if they can move up, as I said, in a counterclockwise fashion uh, towards the large cap space. As an outlook, um, we always start with the milestones on page 33. You see on the left-hand side what has happened in the first half of 2021. On the right-hand side, expectation for upcoming milestone. We already have passed a very important one. That was Intracellar that just announced a couple of days ago, actually positive phase three data in bipolar depression patients for lunateparone. The product is already approved for schizophrenia. It's called Caplita. We think with this label expansion that's possible now for 2021, Intracellar has their a major additional growth opportunity ahead. And you see many, many more milestones upcoming um, in the second half. These are important because if positive, they will ultimately translate what you see on page 34 actually into these gray boxes, which mean product approval or registrational decisions. And um, we had a very positive year already in 2020 uh, as such, with one exception uh, for Intercept, which got a surprise complete response letter from FDA, but many positive news that you see above that one. And then three remaining approval opportunities uh, one being Relugolix for my event, the other one being Lumasuron for all nylon, and the last one being Marchituxima uh, for Macrogenics. And this continues to have substantial importance for uh, BU Biox portfolio because that drives, if we do an in situ calculation, how our overall portfolio looks like, over proportional revenue growth you see on the left hand side. And the disclaimer these are our internal estimates. Um, that we have, you see on the left hand side, the different launch years for the different products to reach approvability. And on the right hand side, the different disease area or therapeutic area uh, that I said, make it pretty obvious why neuro-oncology, orphan disease, cardiovascular and others are actually of importance because they contribute very substantially um, uh, to our growth opportunity and growth trajectory for our portfolio for the coming years. I want to close it out, not by going through page 36, but just quickly um, outline um, 
we are in the midst of an election cycle, meaning we are in the race uh, for uh, either having Biden or Trump as the next uh, US president or to be elected for the next four years. Of actually even bigger importance for us is how um, actually Congress shapes out or shakes out in terms of um, who controls uh, the two chambers that we have because you need and require the Congress actually if you want to have any more substantial reform of the healthcare industry and actually uh, want to have the approval of more impactful law as such. So for us, that's even more important. But our focus continues to be to actually find, identify, and then invest into the appropriate technologies that we think will be the main reason, as I said, to sustain over proportional revenue and profit growth for the future. And just to highlight this, uh, we think Moderna is there a post child of this, how investment in innovation can ultimately lead to very attractive profiles and acceleration of all of this. And hopefully, as I said, uh, our portfolio plays a part of well of the COVID-19 solution to go forward. With that, I thank you for your attention and um, looking forward to soon update you on the Q3 results um, and the Q3 portfolio that we're going to have in mid-October. Thank you very much, Daniel. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we gave you a very interesting short and, and a good insight into BB Biotech's portfolio and future drug development. In particular, I want to highlight the sales growth of over 20% uh, up to 2024 on slide 35, which shows the future potential of BB Biotech's portfolio. And this is not only based on COVID developments, but on a broad range of uh, interesting uh, product developments. If you have any questions on these topics or on BB Biotech, please contact your relationship manager or send us an email on info at bellevue.ch. On this note, I would like to thank you for your participation and I wish you all the best for your future. Stay healthy. <laughs>